I'd like to uh, thank Sarah Rice, first of all, for all of her help, the divine Sarah, as I call her, and Ezra Feldman for being there and helping um, through the fire this morning, but more on that in a minute. Um, and Barbara and David Zelaznik, I want to thank them for funding our reading series, so important. And thank you for joining us on this snowy April day. Where are the songs of spring? Where are they? Think not of them, we have our music too, in the presence of Stephen Yenser, dis distinguished professor of all things cool, as I think of him, and director of Dazzling Blueness at UCLA. Uh, Stephen is swiftly learning that Ithaca isn't easy. As you might have heard, there was a fire at the Statler Hotel, and all guests, including Stephen, were evacuated from the rooms at 8 a.m. and led through the cold to the ILR Conference Center for Displaced Poets. So, <laughs> but he's here, and he's from L.A. What could be crueler than coming from L.A. to, to this rude awakening? Maybe this would be a good time to mention that Stephen's first book was called The Fire in All Things, and it won the Walt Whitman Award from the Academy of American Poets. His second collection is Blue Guide, and a new volume, Stone Fruit, is forthcoming. Yenser's other honors include the B.F. Connors Prize from the Paris Review, an Ingram Merrill Fellowship, multiple appearances in the Best American Poetry Series, and Fulbright Fellowships to France and Greece. His critical books are A Boundless Field, American Poetry at Large, Circle to Circle, The Poetry of Robert Lowell, and another book is The Consuming Myth, The Work of James Merrill. And he also has co-edited five collections of poems by James Merrill, and he's currently at work on Merrill's selected letters. So uh, that's a lot. And Stephen Yenser is one of the very few great critical thinkers writing about contemporary poetry today. He combines depth of knowledge with a poet's closeness to poetry. His prose is gorgeously written and attentive, attentively generous toward the work under consideration. Uh, these strengths are especially evident in his writing on James Merrill. Merrill's work, which is so diverse in content and form, requires more than literary knowledge. It requires, I think, a kind of intellectual chutzpah and Yenser is supremely equal to that task. His latest collection of poetry, Blue Guide, takes its title from the well-known series of travel guides, the Blue Guides. It's a cartographic tapestry built from the fabric of Los Angeles, Greece, Baghdad, New York, even Kansas. An intricate, exquisite fugue, Blue Guide synthesizes music, painting, poetry, but I can't help but think of Yenser himself as the blue guide to these overlapping vistas, a guide who's both reverent and mischievous, the kind who'd follow the museum tour with a quick trip to Jumbo's clown room. In jazz, a blue note is a worried note, a note sung or played at a slightly weirded pitch. And like the bent note of, of say, Coltrane's sax, Yenser's music is full of slippage. Spirare, which is Latin for breath, slips into the word spirea, a flower. The sussurus of waves and shore create a spindrift as liquid and solid coexist in a shape-shifting, music-making flux. The poems move effortlessly through time, space, levels of discourse, stratas of diction. In this Ovidian world, the emptiness of an MRI tube morphs into the bridal chamber. A cricket collaborates with an open-air recitation of Merwin's cricket poem. The breezy music of Los Angeles recalls the temple of Athena Nike, which in its form resembles a cycladic harp. In visual terms, the poem's surfaces are sfumato, a painterly technique, that blurs edges and blends one thing into the next. Now, a blue note, and Stephen's poems are really jazzy, as you would know if, if you've read them. A blue note can also be a note from a minor scale juxtaposed against a major progression 
that lends a kind of blue coloration to the melody. And in his longer poems, such as Los Angeles Fractals, Yenser bends time and scale in a sometimes intoxicating, sometimes somber recollection of intentions connecting flights till the poem becomes a sprawling mimetic meditation on, this is a quote, the mazed conjuries of these cities, or rather multiplicities in this non-city of ethnicities. He uses signage in a painterly way, like the glazes, scrapes, and stencils in Larry Rivers' cool and jazzy canvas. There's also uh, cameo appearances by Romare Bearden, Dylan Thomas, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Bing Crosby, Paul Desmond, and Mark Twain. And in this poem, um, it just moves the, with the poet, between the poet's habits and his habitation, his place, in a kind of dazed haze of signs and signifiers, links and linking, drinks and drinking. It expands from the smallest fractal scale to the broadest sweep of the city, with centers everywhere, like Pascal's God. It's an excessive place. The LA, can I say this? A labyrinth? A labyrinth? Okay. Licensed by a vanity plate that reads signify. And there's so many vanity plates in LA. Um, so Yenser, I think, has achieved Nietzsche's goal of becoming serious as a child at play for his expansive meditations on the world's whole horde, cut to the quick. There's always a knit of identity, always a cascade of linguistic slippage in this rich palimpsest, till everything is strings that vibrate. It's a privilege to introduce one of the finest poets and critics of his or anyone's generation, Stephen Yenser. Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you. Uh, I wish one-tenth of that were, were true, uh, and I appreciate the, uh, uh, the thought. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm very happy to meet uh, Roger Gilbert, too, whom I uh, have just learned is a friend of uh, Lanny Hammers, who is the writer of the biography, uh, the authorized biography of James Merrill, uh, which has just appeared, which is a great book. Uh, I urge you all to, uh, to get it. Uh, and I see some Merrill's poems are up here, too, so this looks like a James Merrill day. Uh, anyway, I'm delighted to be associated with James Merrill. I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm having trouble with my eyes, and so occasionally I'm going to block out my face in order to see the page. Um, I'm going to read from uh, Blue Guide, and then I'll read uh, a few poems uh, from Stone Fruit which is the volume that is now uh, in press. Uh, and I thought I'd start with, uh, after I get my clock out here, um, a short poem that uh, came, came up by the way in Alice's class today, uh, because we were talking about, uh, at least it came up in my mind, uh, we were talking about economy and um, Emily Dickinson and, uh, and so on. And this, this poem, there's much more commentary in this poem than there is poem. The poem is, is a wisp of a thing. Uh, but it's interesting that it was inspired to, by Dorothea Tanning, uh, the wonderful surrealist painter who, at the, the last time she was doing her painting, doing any painting, she turned at age 95 or so to poetry and wrote some wonderful verse. But um, she did a suite of paintings uh, that were, uh, that she called another language of flowers. You know, all know about the old language of flowers. Well, this is a new language of flowers, and the paintings she did are individual flowers, surrealistic flowers. Uh, she had 12 of them, one for every uh, month of the year, I guess. Uh, and uh, she, so she got 12 friends of hers who were poets to write little lyrics to entitle the, the paintings, 12 of them. And there were a few rules. The first rule was it had to have the, the Latin name. Uh, the second rule was that it had to have the, the common name. Uh, and the third rule was it had to be spoken by the, by the flower itself. And the fourth rule was it had to be very short. <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, so this, is, this is called uh, Flagrantus Speculum Winaris which is a ridiculous uh, concoction, meaning uh, the uh, burning mirror of Venus. 
that is the Latin name of the, of the flower. The English name is love knot. And you, uh, it's spelled with a K, but maybe the K shouldn't be there. Um, so this, this is the way it goes. So don't, don't breathe or you will miss it. <laughs> I am flesh and flower that each other devour. Tongue-tied lovers know it's myself I swallow. Okay. <laughs> um, this is a short poem, that's why it's here, uh, partly. It's a valediction for a uh, poet that uh, I knew very well at Los, in Los Angeles, Charles Guffins. Some of you might know his work. He was a, uh, an early Wintersian, which is to say that he was a very formalist, very rigorous uh, poet. Uh, he was also a uh, Francophile. Uh, and, um, this is a poem that is strange in that um, the Charles, Charles' stage of 1929 to 1993, I knew him for 15, 20 of those years, um, and um, I, I knew about this poem long before he died or was even ill. Uh, and I, I knew about it uh, because of his initials and because of his uh, fondness of the French. Um, and it happens that his initials are the, uh, almost the same as the phrase that you find on French tomb tombstones, meaning here lies someone, like R-I-P, except in French it's, it's here lies, or C-G, which is C-G. So I, I felt kind of guilty about this for a long time. I had, I had a phrase for a short allergy long before Charles was even ill. Um, but anyway, I have it, since I had it, I went ahead and wrote it. Uh, after he died. And so this is uh, Charles Gullens, A Valediction. It's in manometer. One beat per line. We pass, alas. CG, CG. Whose life penned strife and passion fashioned from rough cut stuff. Deep mind is diamond, verses terse, faceted, tacit. I'll get longer now. Um, I'm going to read a uh, suite of poems for, uh, for my daughter. Uh, the first one is in longer lines. You'll be relieved to know. And uh, then I'll read another three from, uh, from this, this little suite. Uh, <clears throat> the first one is called uh, MRI, a trance. And I'm sure that many of you have had the pleasure of uh, having an M MRI, uh, which is usually accompanied by other uh, uh, experiences. They give, will give you a tranquilizer, for example, if you, if you like one, which I like and uh, I, I got. And uh, so this is MRI of trance and it's for my daughter, Helen. So there I am at tower imaging, imaging. Yes, yes, I'm aging, drugged against the claustrophobia Oh heart, oh troubled heart, a live shell of myself, levered into the bridal chamber at last, so to speak. And I have left my metal, my watch and coins, my pen, my keys, my belt and zippered slacks, and donned a gown. And though scared stiff, been slid condemned as a condemned phallus, into a pulsing place where I lie listening through earphones to KKJZ FM playing just then the Bill Holman quintet playing Out of This World. Under the broadcast music and others din, percussive, pneumatic, Dionysian pounding in and out and in in some code of its own in some remorseless morse the pictures of my favorite feelings, quarters. We're looking at the plumbing, the PVC, and something called the, the bundle of hiss. We're eavesdropping on the heart's tick-tock, enthusiastic tachycardia. I don't know how to phrase this synesthetic clang. It's not at all clear what is happening or when. We're loading every riff with ore, maybe or waiting to explode, 
or maybe make a broken consort's music of these spheres. Now, as foretold, we go through several phases or movements, although I am motionless, sedately terrified. My life aflow behind closed eyes, I flatly fail not to remember all these years ago, so long before you squeezed into our world, Helen, crawling the passageway to Cheops' penetralia to find nothing, a lidless sarcophagus, emptier than a skull's eye holes. During the break between the five that thrive and sweets and train, I hear cicadas, an eerie ostinato making the breezy music of a Cretan olive tickle the ear, until I pick up your great-grandpa's blow humming through his tissue-covered comb as we drive by neat rows of winter wheat back home. And off in that past's future, I can make out the lonesome cricket who sits in, jams in, one evening in the Sunset Canyon Recreation Center in Westwood, California, so thrilled to find his finely calibrated kind, so finely celebrated, as William Merwin reads his poem called Black Jewel. And now I hear some ice cubes, all whiskied up, tinkling under Errol Garner's right hand. Or is it my father's, as he sits listening to Blue Lou and Misty on a 78, smoke unfurling from the other hand's brown Raleigh, and waiting for that last high note, pure as a tuning forks. Minute by minute now, the tranquilizer ebbs, and to my aging, still sublunar ear, the tone finally struck is just a smidgen sharp. It pricks this bubble, although another one will one day lift and lovely drift me off with all the trances, travels, and travails that leaving you, I've imagined leaving you, ravels and ravelings, recordings, the broken string of my rabab, my souk Arabic, my taxi Greek, somehow restrung to sound in scheme and skein, notes that float across the bars, like something you chased yesterday across the lawn. Today is not that day, and so they pull me out. Paradise Cove, uh, an old poem for my daughter. Um, this sprang from a pun that I have now seen, alas, a half dozen times at least, uh, but I swear I was there first. Uh, Paradise Cove, place in California. My, my daughter in the coastal sunset asks for Plato. Plato, she begs, Blue Plato, please. Plato. Finally, I understand, and rummage from the picnic ba basket the Play-Doh, the blue can, and the pink as well, which henceforth I call Aristotle. <laughs> Aristotle, Aristotle, she repeats, then swallowing the glottal, aerosol. And there we are, playing with both ideas that there are. For one, this mixogamous world is all one thing. And for the other, this waxing unicity is always two <clears throat> or more, which, <clears throat> excuse me, two or more, which is the same, since to rub two things together in a ruddish realm is to get others, and those yet others, viz. our daughters and their sons. The temporizing third idea, that these two are somehow one, returns us to the first. So Marcus Aurelius thought, and maybe Lao Tzu. In any event, Nietzsche teaches that each thinker's goal and do is to become as serious as a child at play. Even as the sun sinks, even when again the sun is setting or Rather, here in Los Angeles, 
lax land, city of angles. The set is stunning, even in, is stunning, I'm sorry, it's, it's stunning, stunning even is the way that line goes. Uh, even in ever acuter, gentler rays that with dismays turn the horizon technicolor pinks and blues, lavenders and zincs. Helen's Zen. Today you told us how a too tight shoe gave you such a headache in the foot. In your next breath, you said you'd made a wish. I said, why don't you wait till it comes true so that it will and tell it then. You said you didn't think you could do that. Why not? Because I wished that we would die together, you and mommy and me. And when we're dead, I don't think that we talk. Well, I said, as for your foot, by then you'd gone ahead. I think that maybe only souls go through, you know? You know, I said, you say you know too much? Anyway, the soul, you said, I hope it has a belly button, don't you? Kids say the greatest things if you, I, I didn't write down so many things, that, and where are they now? Tide Pools, uh, it's a poem in couplets. Quick, mystic, this is the world's profoundest mirror. The girl in any of us leans a little nearer. You lean to it this evening, Helen, Emily, holding my hand to glimpse us both, though dreamily, as like your breath that fogs my morning shaving glass, it dries up seaward, leaving sea moss, black tape grass, scary weeds, also a puckered seam of sea spray, a pinch of which you put your lips to, then spin away, barefoot braid swinging from a broken breaker, your shrieks bringing a cloud wisps, blush brushed color to your cheeks, then kneel again to moons and trumpets, scallops, dollars, and mermaid fans and purses, anemones and tiny stars. Another winter day, my love, when you are older, that is when we are both older, half bolder and half colder, maybe we'll walk back down here to this place if whose precise location traffic -y years erase from memory, no matter, since to it the sun blazes a narrow path each cloudless day that's done, and see how I could come once more to recognize this world's whole horde one evening in your filling eyes. So that's, uh, that's, that's all for my daughter, I think. Um, I'm going to uh, read another poem that's uh, in distics, um, by which I just mean two line stanzas, and they don't rhyme, but it's a razzle, and some of you will know the, the razzle, the form. It's been around for a thousand years or so in uh, Persian and, uh, and in Arabic. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a demanding form, probably shouldn't be tried in English. Um, the first two lines have an identical rhyme, and then the, the even-numbered lines following all rhyme with that second line, but there is a preceding rhyme, too. Uh, so you'll, you'll see that every second, fourth, sixth line, you get, you get two rhymes uh, coming up. Um, in the, in the Rosal, um you're supposed to sign your name at the end, um, and you can do this any way you, you choose. Uh, I'm not going to tell you right now the, the, the way in which I sign my name, but I will tell you later. If anybody knows Yiddish, then you, they, will, they will know how I sign my name. Uh, it's, for, uh, it's for a friend who, who was in Baghdad for a long time and then exiled from Baghdad. Uh, 
called a Razel of names because a lot of other names come up in it. So Razel of names. Today, my friend, when all the scarified world implies a web, this Razel is for you, who told me that word signifies a web. The poem, by the way, is disjunctive. The, the couplets don't relate to each other unless they do. And if you can make some sense of them, you're welcome. Uh, and uh, I, it's always, I, 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 I of course felt that I had some, some linkage, but it, they're, they're supposed to be disjunctive. When Stein saw in a lightning strike the difference is spreading, her insight lit up all the acts from which arise the web. Your tigresses meandering cursives far from my rap cities, and yet beneath each culture's rhapsodies there lies a web. You know, because he was a weaver too, that Webster knew, because all languages are foreign, they must comprise a web. Cowpat, Kuhandel, cow's parsley, la voie lactée, it's all a mesh. Scrutinize the wings, each dung-drawn, web-doomed flies a web. From their own pincer-like pararachnid vantages, egoists like Saddam and Bush presume to tyrannize the web. My friend, whose name suppressed perforce can mean physician, Vesalius showed how selfhood will just disguise the web. Ghazali, self-exiled like you from Baghdad, sought certitude. He found the cosmic soul that unifies the web. Now here I am, giddy in Yiddish, dizzy with razzle dazzle, arch fornicator, satisfied he ramifies the web. None of you know Yiddish. Occasionally I meet somebody who, who knows, uh, I guess all Yiddish is street Yiddish, but this is really street Yiddish. And uh, I can tell when somebody knows some Yiddish. Uh, they all, you know, you look away for a minute. Uh, a, uh, a Yenser is a fornicator uh, in, in Yiddish. So arch fornicator, Yenser, uh, that's the way the, the name is signed at the, at the end of that poem. This poem is called Variations on Ovid. And uh, it's, uh, it is, indeed, Variations on a Line in Ovid, uh, which uh, goes like this in uh, the English translation. Um, Envious Minerva's belligerent crow lives on. Okay. Minerva's belligerent crow lives on, though your beautiful parrot, Karina, has, has died. Uh, it's uh, one of those poems that's kind of, kind of built on uh, um, Catullus' sparrow poem, sparrow poems to Lesbia, and the death of the bird, and so on. So, uh, so this is about crows um, and the persistence of the crow. It's in haiku, um, which is not an advisable form, I think, in English for anybody. Uh, Alice's friend and mine, uh, Richard Howard, uh, used to be poetry editor for the New Republic, the Nation, one, one of them, and um, he finally finally had to retire. And uh, somebody asked him why why he was giving it up. He had this uh, this opportunity to publish new poets and well-known poets, and so I said, he said, "Oh my dear, uh, after a while, I just felt that I'd been nippled to death by goldfish because of the haiku." Which little goldfish nibbling away at him. Okay, uh, variations on Ovid. Like mother's screaming, the crow's cause seemed to rip its own bloody throat out. Father's old crow hid in our garage till you smashed dead its dadgum head. Each dawn's hangover the cock sang his own crowbar or two, poor bastard. Next year, a tire iron 
meted out to my bombed skull 17 stitches. Scorched angel fallen to pine's tip, Christmas's crow must cope with mad songbirds. Craving blackbird pie, Astrid sought out books on rooks and dug up Macbeth. But though the raven counts as crow, the blackbird's still a quick thrush, craven. When the dyer's hand rolled two cold and coal black eyes, was the crow's die cast? Because C was K, crow is work, backward, backward, blackward. Because claws. The adamant claws clinging to one's every word vouches, this one counts. At the road's crossing, three crows pick at a squirrel who would not eat crow. The poet's host raised a dark toast. May the best dressed guest roast y'all and turn. A loud white fact here, a cockatoo cries his crew of crows through Bel Air. Black hole, the mind's eye's pupil, takes bright teachers in, straight as the crow flies. There, there was famously a, uh, a cockatoo, a white cockatoo who had, who had escaped in uh, some pet shop and who hung out with a bunch of crows in uh, Beverly Hills and adjacent and uh, could see him you know, frequently, uh, he or her, leading the, the crows uh, across the sky. A very interesting sight. Okay, so I'm going to uh, leave Blue Guide and uh, read a few poems from... Uh, Stone fruit. Let's start with the Kansas poem or two and we'll go back to the, the short line poems. Um, this one is called uh, Preserves, as in what you put up in the winter from, from fruit, stone fruit uh, especially. Preserves. <clears throat> Nervy, sparrow like, eyes Cherokee. Blackberry black, arrow quick, picky eater, meager spirit, converted Quaker. She taught her grandson arithmetic and pruning tactics and let him touch through her cotton nighty small tense nipples. Her hands are thritic knitted doilies, breaded tomatoes, pureed apples, and put up apricots while the hoarded gilts made for bright quilts, the torrid migraines counterpanes. <clears throat> this is a Wichita triptych, three short poems. <clears throat> Sometimes the rain shines just when the sun rains, and that is the way it was since that was the way it is beyond the French doors that late afternoon here in this mind's early morning where they still fade in that cool color Polaroid pastels of her prom dress, its bowl of double peonies, promising, precocious, trying, trying to open. Their friend and he were tight, tightrope walkers, self-taught, taught trope talkers, stalking jam up, arm in arm, and caroling to lucky stars of cars, bars, and rebars. The night a carousel of smoky tryst and trough, of casual arousals, cocky carousals, pitching the dark to the dark. Streetlight and moth reader, she married both. <clears throat> I 
But then there he was <clears throat> in the morning's morning, soi Proustian minion, aesthetic, ascetic, and Kansas rube, reducing his thought to a bouillon cube no one suitably hot ought ever pour over. I'm going to read a poem that is in sections. Uh, I'm not going to read it all. I'll just read a few sections. Uh, it's a longer line. It's a very long line. Um, and it's a, it's a meditative poem. Uh, it's uh, also elegiac. Uh, James Merrill was my friend in Greece, among other places. And uh, this is written after he died. <clears throat> and always when I, when I wrote then about Greece, I was thinking about, about James. Uh, so uh, this is called Cycladic Idol, because it is set on one of the Cyclades, the Cyclades in, in Greek, uh, and an apologia. It has an epigraph uh, from a friend, Bill Ettinger, who uh, said once to me, because I go over to Greece whenever I can, he says, I don't know why you don't just go over to Catalina. This poem doesn't go any place. Uh, it's a it's a meditative poem. Uh, there there isn't any any plot, uh, so I, I ask for your patience. This is section three of the poem. I come here not to contemn my city's columbaria of condominiums and book emporia, with their stacks of fresh books on chocolate, chalk a block with guides to the Galapagos and Godot and their tables laden with books on coffee tables and books on coffee table books. <clears throat> and not to malign the midnight supermarket's own tropic aisles with their tanned and juicy shrink-wrapped dates, their bruised ripe figs burnished by gelled lights, oh psychedelicacies, and the racks of razors and glossy magazines and analgesics I come not to ditch the Academy's deliciously multiplicitous pharmacon, though disembarking, I accidentally dropped into the sea my faithful dop kit, full of the life-saving medicines that it took down, perhaps as it chose, since it seemed to leap from my hand through an opening just its size. I come here to address not deconstruction, but myself, to address myself to the oregano, a whiff on the breeze, nostalgic and heady, a skunk, cropping up beside the ubiquitous retaining walls and boundary walls, built of the ubiquitous stone, culled from the fields, or axed and levered out of outcrops, sometimes faced or split, sometimes filled with scrabbled flinders, fitted, mortarless, tight as puzzle pieces, built with what would now be tortuous lifting, hugging and lugging, done under the long, low sun over decades, decades of decades. The stones settling in subtly, row on row, adamant and indistinct as the years themselves, by hard men, faceless and various as the stones themselves. According to lore, the discontented among them come back at night during autumn to pitch to fields pitch dark, beneath the vast broadcast of stars to monitor their work, to make repairs to those boundaries that are their bonds with this world. Each has many, many headstones, none with a name. They did not, O oh, onanistic, onomastician, make names for themselves, those men, but wall stones and courses of them since stone by stone makes a wall, and walls make farming and farming homes. Homes they went back to at dusk, and maybe beat their women in, in the unbeatable heat, and maybe had hard or fearful sex in, as the parching Maltemi lashed the night, and the fishermen's lashed up boats apart, and anyway yelled things they sometimes did not think could be set down in words who set these stones they harvested in place for all but ever. I'm going to read one more poem. 
Um, it's, uh, it's also a Greek poem. Uh, it's called, uh, a short one called uh, Psalm on Siphnos. Again, one of the Cyclades. One does not want, O oh Lord, to heap up by still waters of words a cairn, but hopes to attend a small covert of tamarisk, whose leaves salty yet feathery will shed light over the thickened plot. One wants at last to seed the field to tamarisk and mastic tree, to olive and stone, stones in the fruit, seed in the stones. Thank you very much. So I gather there's a Q&A here. Uh, I run a series like this in Los Angeles, and I never allow people to do Q&As. Uh, but uh, I, uh, for you, I would be glad to do it. Uh, you have any questions? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to turn you off of questions. Uh, I, I can answer questions, uh, some of them, a couple of them. Uh, questions about uh, prose, poetry, life, literature, the pursuit of happiness? Yes? I would love to you know what's <laughs> your affection for the spoonism. And maybe beyond that, when you think about the accidentals showing up in poetry. Oh, that's a very complicated question and, and a wonderful one. Uh, Thank you. Uh, the Spoonerism, when's my affection for it? It, go, it goes along with my affection for wordplay of all kinds. You know what a Spoonerism is, of course, the transposition of the first two letters in two words that are adjacent to one another, and you, you have heard some of them in the poems. Uh, um, I think I like, I, I, I don't know, I've never really plumbed the depths of my affection. Uh, but I, I think it must have something to do with combinations of things that make a third thing. And here you get it twice in, the, in the two different meanings that come up. Uh, one of my favorites, boy, this is a James Merrill day, uh, is from James Merrill, who, who had a friend named Robert Morse, who wrote some brilliant spoonerisms. Uh, one of them is included in W.H. Auden's commonplace book. It's, it's a tour de force of uh, about 20, 25 lines of made up of spoonerism. Uh, and at one point in one of James's poems, he's talking about two figures that are in sync and yet antagonistic to each other. And so he notes of them that one wand hashes the other. <laughs> uh, so because of that kind of thing, I like them, I guess. And then the accidental, thank God for it. Uh, I mean, I think that's one reason why you write poems. Um, I don't think any of us knows what's going to happen when we, when we write a decent poem. If we know, it's probably not a decent poem. And you discover things along the way. There's this little true vi, that little true vi. Um, so one depends on the, the accidental, I think, to help one get along, looks for it. Needs it. Uh, that's, it's a great question. Anything else? Okay, let's go get something to drink and eat.